CTN and our primary sources for this morning. And as we get underway, while folks are coming into the room, I want to get us collected here with a little bit of a, an intro for our guests. As a creatives, and particularly within the realm of music, as a musician, um, we train, we work hard, we, we develop a, our talents and skills. It's true of every discipline. One area that is most key as a harpist is one of the important things that we work on is pitch. Um, this is an important part of this instrument because with so many strings and so many variables, we're often playing out of tune. So pitch is quite important. And the harp is unique in that you can visually see how that pitch is being altered through whatever steps you take. You are seeing the action of the plucking of the string to create the pitch. And there are a series of pedals that are maneuvered. Few people realize this, but we're very busy with our feet and our hands and our mind to create what the uh, final outcome is as musicians. The, the pedals trigger a series of pins that alter the string and change the pitch, raising it a half step higher or lower. As musicians, pitch is an important part of it. The degree or height or depth of a tone or of a sound. And it always surprised me that pitch could also apply to other things, many other things such as baseball. <laughs> Pretty obvious there. The work that it takes to hone a proper pitch to get that ball past a distance at a certain speed to sort of uh, either make contact or avoid contact with the bat. There's a science to that. There's an art to that. There are years of training and talent applied to sending off the perfect pitch to and then receiving that pitch to create a home run. And we can take all of these elements, the serving of the ball to a batter by the pitcher or preceded by a windup or stretch or finding a certain pitch within a tone. And we can also apply this idea of pitch to, to stories and other ideas. Now there are a number of ideas out there in the world, a wide range of them and the challenge in this area of pitching is to find the idea that is actually going to work best. What do we do to shape that that's ready to be told that we can place into the context of being able to be out there to pitch? There's a lot of work that goes into shaping this, getting an idea ready, formulating it so that what it, that spark of what that idea comes through In the area of creative storytelling, it's often a high pressure talk or a message intended to sell or win approval for something. A very different approach to pitching. And there's a unique chain of events almost that have to happen to come together before a director can focus their vision and get that story pitched to a room so everyone is on the same page and has a collective idea of this story. And then before it makes its way into its final form. And our guests today are masters at this. Um, both legendary animators on various projects and story artists and writers and directors on some of a wide range of films, both in studio settings, independent stories, live action, animation. And it is a great pleasure to welcome today two of our most creative minds in the realm of storytelling, Rob Minkoff and Roger Allers. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. And that- uh, You're welcome. Becomes your cue to have that camera. Yeah. Great, it's lovely okay. to have you guys here. When you know when this when your when your when your pitch started, I was like, I think we're in the wrong room. <laughs> like we're, we're talking about uh, uh, playing the harp, and I was like, wow, I think this has got to be a music class. I uh, had a but I, I appreciated your I appreciated your circuitous route to yes. getting to to where we are. 
Well, thank you. Well, a little, little, exactly a little um, journey to get us to this conversation and open our minds to the wider realm of, of this, this world of storytelling and ideas and getting them shaped into films and, and experiences and adventures that we know and love and treasure. I mean, you guys are behind certainly one of the all-time greats, The Lion King. Um, and so much that was such a pivotal film to, in not only in animation, but in film history, Broadway history, uh, really transformative in so many ways. But it still had to begin somewhere. It had to start somewhere, just a germ of an idea. Um, let's uh, talk about this idea of ideas. Where do you as, as creatives kind of cultivate ideas for projects that you're doing? I, I've, obviously things are brought to you. Um, you're perhaps packaged with something. But when you're sitting down and, and uh, thinking, okay, what's my next project going to be? What, what am I interested in, in doing? Where, what stories do I want to be telling? Where do you go to to get those ideas? Oh, it's, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I have to say, personally, through most of my career, I was asked, you know, would you do this? project, you know, and a lot of times either uh, some work had been done on it already, you know, some idea work had been done on it. Uh, in other ones, uh, there was already a subject matter that they wanted to, to do. And I started from scratch, but uh, I have to say, uh, on the other times that I've come up with ideas, one of them was uh, inspired by a movie. So uh, there are those. Uh, I don't know, Rob. You've you've done a lot of different things. Yeah. Your idea for the uh, forbidden. Yeah. Thing, where did that well, come? From? I mean that <clears throat> that particularly th was actually already a screenplay when I got involved. So I oh. I read the screenplay, which was called The Monkey King. Mm -hmm. um, the, the title got changed, but I think you know it's funny. I think that if you're a creative person, you know you it's hard to stop thinking creatively. And I often just pose the question to myself, what would be a good story? What would be interesting? And my mind wanders here and there. And, you know, you sort of go, that would be, you know, that would be a subject that I kind of calls you. So I don't know if I don't, I wouldn't describe it as going somewhere, particularly. It just sort of, it kind of just happens. I think that, you know, when you get, when you uh, put yourself in that position, in that situation where, you know, sort of being creative is, is, is now becomes a job, obviously, you know, you, but you sort of have to always dive into it, but I don't, but it's, but I don't think of it as necessarily going to a place. It's just, it just, it just happens, you know, it's sort of, um, it's just, you know, part of the, part of the process of it. When you are getting, Roger, as you said, you were oftentimes projects are brought to you mm -hmm. that might speak to you about something that, says yeah I can I can work with this there are things here there's there's stuff to play with room to to uh, work with yeah. here I know in in one one instance uh, I, I met a person actually it was at Rob's house uh, so he's a mutual friend of ours Sergio and uh, in my first meeting with him he said he told me I have an idea that you should do and so he told me uh, the idea about an individual, an historical individual. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'll look into it. Thank you. And um, so that was it. That was just the beginning of it. I knew nothing about this person until I started researching it. And then I got very excited about it. And the more, the more I, I delved into it, the, the bigger the, the idea about what it could be developed. And I, it, I think it is kind of at least for me, it's less about digging forward with great intention and more about just kind of wandering through the information or the visual world and see what gets you excited. And, and then your brain starts cooking things up. It goes, oh, that could be, you know, and it kind of almost happens on its own. You know, I find it's not very, uh, logical or even intentional in a way. You just kind of open yourself up and things just start popping up. Sure. 
all the, uh, and I, I totally agree with that. But there are times, as I'm sure Roger uh, will attest, where you're on a project, let's say, and things aren't coming easily, <laughs> and you're and you're pounding your head against the wall or wherever it is. You know, you're trying to beat an idea out of your head, or you or you have a problem that just seems in, you know unsolvable. And so there are those moments as well. You know, you can't, you, it doesn't always just happen uh, <laughs> like that. It's wonderful when it does. The truth is I've always thought that that's to me, that that's a sign of a, a project that's wor worthy. Meaning when things start to flow very naturally and organically and things start to grow and build uh, without stopping, you know, then you really feel like, oh, I think that there's, I think this is really a good a, you know, a good project because there are for sure times where it doesn't happen. And, you know, and, and quite often those projects don't survive, you know, that they die somehow, they die on the vine. Yeah. Is it a question also of uh, collaborators, um, who you're working with, the uh, team that you pull together? Um, are you working to surround yourself with uh, like-minded people, people with very different views? Are you looking for talent? I mean, obviously well, it's very from project to project, but. I, I think it's interesting because you don't always have a, an absolute freedom of choice about that. So sometimes you sort of have to do the best with what you've got, but there are some things that I think we learn as good uh, habits about collaboration, which, which is, and one thing, and I think it's key in every kind of good creative group you're in is that you're required to not edit yourself, which can be a very challenging thing for people. You're, you're actually saying, this is a terrible idea, or let me pitch you the bad version of it, that you're not, if you have an idea or something that you want to express, that you must actually share it in the group as stupid or terrible or horrible as it might be, and as embarrassed as you might be about sharing it, that you have to do it because you it's it's almost the, the the path you have to take to find the good idea you know you sort of have to start somewhere and even though it may not be fully formed or 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 perfect or far from it you know that you have to so so get it having that uh uh trust in the group of people that you're working with that allows you to be very open um and share openly and honestly and not be afraid of you know looking stupid I, there's there's another aspect to that too is like in a director situation um, I really also have to work on being very open to whatever is being suggested at the moment somebody has a story idea whatever in the moment especially when you're in in like hard times and you're trying to solve problems because for me everything that I feel shows up on my face you know what I mean? <laughs> so like when you're in a group of people and you want to encourage creativity, it's very bad if you're, they're putting, presenting an idea and your face is going, mm. <laughs> <laughs> which is something I have to work on. But, uh, but that's the other part of it is like everybody has to do that. Everybody has to work at uh, uh, creatively and openly listening to the, to the new ideas. Sure, but I've, I've had experience with that. Something else as well. A bad sure, idea can lead to a great idea. You know what I mean? Or it's... But I've I've had experience with that face, Roger. I've I've but I, I but I but I think but also what's important, even if that's how you're feeling, it's important actually to be expressive of that. It actually is helpful because what you're trying to do, especially when you're collaborating, and Roger and I, you know, did on on the movie, we sort of had a ground rule, which was that it it, it couldn't be either one of us. It actually had to be both of us to agree that the idea was good enough. And so what that did was it forced us probably to come up with a, a better version or a better idea. So if I pitched something to Roger and he sort of gave me that crinkled up face, like, oh, I don't know, but, but, but we wouldn't leave it at that because we would say, well, well let's, let's talk through this and let's see where this goes. Cause I have a feeling, you know, I'm, I'm pitching this cause I think maybe something that we have isn't working or could be better, or here's a way we could do it. And Roger, I don't know, but then we will, we would wrestle with it to the point where we're like, well, what about this? And then you go, yeah, that's great. Okay, that's, that's, that's actually better. 
and part of the the reason that you do that, especially in in the this sort of commercial filmmaking world, where you're making a movie that is supposed to go out and reach the whole world of people, and you're trying as much as you you know can to to make something that works for everyone, it's actually a good practice to to get more than just yourself to like an idea, because in certain circumstances, as an artist, as an individual artist, you're never required to make anyone else care or give a damn about what you what you have in mind or what you want to do. And that's the kind of freedom and power of being an individual artist. However, when you're working in a collaboration like we did at Disney, you have to bring your individual point of view and your individual sensibility, but it's never just your way. It really has to be a collaborative kind of agreement. And that the first, you know, the first people to do that would be me and Roger before we would then present or pitch to other people and ultimately perhaps pitch to Jeffrey or Peter or Tom, all the people that were, were kind of the arbiters of what the work that we were doing and ultimately having to get their approval as well. Um, but, you know, but it starts out with that, that need to collaborate. And, and it does, you know, deal with pitching, which is, I guess, where we started on this, which is, you know, when you have an idea and when you express it, that's the, the, the term that we all use, you're pitching, you know? And, and it's interesting because you brought up the baseball metaphor and I hadn't really thought about that lately, but you know, base, there's a lot of baseball terminology in, in Hollywood, right? Because you get, have a hit, right? It's a home run idea, it's a home run, you know? And so it's not just, you know, pitching, but pitching becomes an enormously important part of it because if you, can express your idea well and effectively and entertainingly and amusing and you know amusingly, you're much more likely to get people to like it or to kind of agree with it, right? If you if you have a great joke and you don't do a good job of presenting it, people won't laugh and they may say, "Well, that's not funny." And you go, "No, it's it is funny. I know this is funny." And actually, maybe the idea was funny, but you did a terrible job of pitching it and made it sound unfunny. And then the, the idea doesn't get picked up by the, by, by the group. So you sort of, you kind of have to use that, um, that, that skill um, and it becomes very important. And what's kind of interesting is uh, uh, many people are required to do that in the animation process, but not everybody is as good as, he, as, as the next person. And, and what's interesting, especially because the character of animators or people in animation typically or tends to be very introverted. That's sort of like, although that may not be true of every, it's certainly not true of everybody, but, but a lot, in not a lot of, of cases, you find, <laughs> not true of us, but in a lot of cases, you find people are more comfortable, you know, maybe doing their drawing or their, or their animation, their scene or their storyboard or their painting or whatever it is that they're doing. And, and it's comfortable for them to kind of be in that relationship with what the work that they're doing. But when it comes to actually standing up and going, hey, look at me, I'm gonna show you this and you're gonna laugh and think it's great. And quite often, it's interesting when you have a storyboard, you know, half the time the audience is looking at the drawings, but truthfully, the audience generally when you do a pitch is quite far from the storyboard. They're not actually able to see, the, at least they, they weren't Back, back at the time, things have, of course changed technologically. And, and I found it's, it's very interesting that when you do a, a pitch today, it's much, actually it's much more effective because you can make the drawing really big. You can put it on a TV monitor or you can put it on a computer monitor, whatever. Uh, and, it, and, it's, and it's a lot more about the visual, but, but back in the day when we all kind of came up through the process, a lot of it was, it was you standing in front of a board with a stick, right? Yeah. And you would act it out. There was benefits to that as well, because, you know, drawings, you could only do so many drawings. And as basically the actor pitching the board, you could fill in a lot of things that weren't necessarily there in the drawing. And you could create that sense of movement and, and the moment of emotion that a drawing doesn't always necessarily communicate. So I really found having the human presence with those boards was a huge factor in being able to make them come alive. I think sometimes now when people just have to present, you know, they have to click through their drawings and that's all there is on the screen. I think sometimes they're handicapped a little bit because they don't get to insert the acting and, you know, to really help lift it up and make it come alive. But I, I, I do, I, I do think that- Being able to 
read the room and get the energy back from your audience as well? Yeah. Sure, but I, I, do, I think though that it's still a kind of an individual thing, meaning people who are more adept at pitching are going to pitch it better no matter what the form is, even if, whether it's a drawing on a, on pinned up on a board or whether you're clicking through drawings on a, on a computer screen, the people who don't lean into the pitch don't lean into the pitch. I, and I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's as much attention paid on that kind of aspect. I mean, actually, I mean, I do know uh, our dear friend Kelly Asbury, who very sadly passed away this year, yeah. uh, taught a class at DreamWorks, I believe, you know, because Jeffrey Katzenberg was having trouble uh, with a lot of the story people who, who didn't have that skill. And he was used to a kind of a great group of, of talented story artists and people who could pitch at Disney. And somehow that, that skill didn't necessarily translate. And so Jeffrey was like, you know what? I don't, if you don't, if, if somebody doesn't know how to pitch or can't pitch well, I don't want to hear them. Like I don't even want to. So then Kelly started a class where he would actually talk to people about what, what the process of pitching is and how to pitch it properly. And it makes a difference when you, when you do that. Um, I know that back in the early, early days, I've mentioned this to you before, Mindy, that you know, there was a, a group of people that, that went to take a class at the Groundlings Theater. And I think the first one that I remember was Joe Ramp. Mm -hmm. And Joe came back and was like, I just took this great class of, on improvisation. And then a number of people, including Kelly, went and took classes. I did as well. I'm not sure, Roger, if you did. But- I, I did some at that actually the studio. Uh, that gave. people came to, to, to teach that at the studio. Yeah, because, because there is an intersection there's an intersection between animation and performance, live performance, that is not always understood or embraced, uh, but it's an, important, it's an important aspect of it. And so, you know, it, it's, it was always a thing where you'd encourage people if they had any inkling of a, of a you know, connection to that or something that they were interested or wanted to do that you'd say, yeah, you go get yourself into an acting class and see what that's like, you know, to get up and actually perform in front of people. A lot of vulnerabilities out there. Um, for <laughs> you've both, well, Rob, you've worked both live action and animation, and uh, uh, talk a little bit about some of the differences. And and Roger, apply uh, your preparation methods. And in, in uh, once you've got this idea and you're formulating it for uh, either animation or live action. Are there differences in how you're preparing with that? The, 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 for me, the, the way I always explain the difference between animation and live action is it, live action is like being a conductor of an orchestra that's all playing simultaneously. And animation is like being the conductor of individual musicians. And you get each one to do what they're supposed to do with no one else around. They can't hear the orchestra. They're just... It's just you and the musician, and they're saying, "What is this supposed to be? And how is how loud am I? What, you know, what is how? What's the energy?" I, and you're having to explain, talk every single artist through it, so that somehow, when you put all the pieces together, they all seem seamlessly blended together in perfect harmony and balance. So in live action, it's much more about you know you get the cacophony of a lot of people coming together simultaneously, and then you have to kind of work with all of them as a group to kind of get get it into kind of shape. Yeah, that's interesting because you must be working with what they're contributing at the time and shaping it, you know, in real times more or less. And one of the one of the talents I think that the, a good director has to have is be able to hold all kind of the performances and everything in their head, even if the performances haven't been made yet, so that they can interact with the person you're directing as if you're the other characters in the scene. It's really important to bring that with you, you know, especially like our recording sessions, we would record the voice actors more often than not, they would be recorded alone. And one of us would be reading the lines with them to make the scene come alive. And you couldn't just read the lines flat because it would, it would affect the actor's performance. So basically you had to kind of rise up to the level and remember what the intention of the scene was, you know, for all the characters and try to fill that in for them. You have to, play for them, you know? Right, and one of the things I remember actually specifically when we went to record Jeremy Irons, 
is, you know, we would work very hard to make sure that they had the script in advance of the recording session. And I remember uh, asking him when he showed up at the studio, I said, did you, did you get the script? And he said, yes. I said, did you have a chance to look it over? And he says, no. And I said, oh, really? And he goes, no, I never do that. I go, you never do that. He goes, no. He said, you know what? Acting is like jazz music. He says, I can't tell you what I'm going to do before I'm in the middle of the thing, working with the other musician, right? Because I have to feed off of their energy and their performance. So I don't, I don't decide what I'm going to do as an actor in a, in a vacuum. And it, and it, you know, it makes a lot of sense. You go, okay, you're right. This is about, and then that's why in animation, we quite often try a lot of different things. You know, you sort of say, I need a, a different tempo, a different intention, a different energy. I need you to hit this line, word as opposed to that word. And you get 20 takes and you know, you know that what that means is, and usually a couple of the best ones kind of ring in your head. You're like, oh, that's a good one. I'll, that'll work. And then you know that in the editing room, when you're building the scene, you've got a lot of choices. You say, okay, let's find the best version of this line. And quite often, and this is something, you know, again, you can do an animation and not necessarily live action. If the actor delivers the first half of the line really, really well in one take and the second half of the line in another take, you go, let's put those together. Because yeah. what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get the best possible performance and you don't quite know how you're going to do it, but you want to give yourself a lot of, a lot of options. Now, Roger, you talked a little bit about um, some of the differences uh, coming to a project as a director the differences between uh, studio settings and an independent setting, what kind of variances, uh, talk a little bit about those differences and what you need to do to uh, charge up for uh, hmm. one versus the other. Right, well, for example, working in a studio like Disney, which was a huge organization and a huge organized organization, I mean, super organized, they had, gotten the system down and there was a lot of support. There were, you know, the heads of all the departments, there were production people overseeing things. They were arranging Rob's and my schedule so that everything moved as clockwork and so that we were informed before each meeting, you know, the day was filled up with all those meetings. And, you know, they were taking notes in the sessions. Then, you know, contrasting that, <coughs> excuse me, with uh, an independent production that I did where the staff was about four people in a room for the whole production. Wow, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot different. And a, a lot more is thrown on each individual. It's thrown on you as a director to try to keep things straight in your own mind. And also on if you only have like one production manager person organizing everything, it's a huge job. So I, I do, you know, not all of us are, are very organizational minds. You know, I am not an organizer, I'm not a producer sort of person. And, uh, you know, some, some are and some are not. And I would just advise people to know your strengths and, uh, you know, try to help yourself out. And, you know, if you don't have it to try to get, you know, the, the organizational help that you need, it really makes a big difference. And you don't want, for example, I was working over Zoom with, with animators around the world uh, on, on the profit and you know, working with people at different time zones all over the world. And you really need to be ready and on your game when one comes up because it's so hard pulling it all together. You know? So uh, definitely for those people who are not of that mind bent, I, you know, I'd say, you know, please work to try to get the proper support. It's really important. Well, as directors, it strikes me, um you've got to be probably the most malleable person in the room in a lot of ways, but yet uh, open to ideas, uh, some degree of flexibility or not. Do you have it's to- It's so interesting. I know what you mean. Sorry, finish your question. Well, I just want to lead that off for you. Um, you have to keep your vision foremost in mind and communicate that, but yet at the same time, stay as open and flexible. It's, it's, a, it's a weird- It's- Dichotomy. It is a dichotomy. And it's also one of the tricky parts, and this is always, I think, one of the hardest parts of the job is when you're in a studio system or you have, a, you know, strong producers or heads of studio that have to be pleased and you have to listen to their notes, you always have to judge, okay, how far do I 
fight the person you know above me <laughs> to you know fight for an idea and how often do i go okay we'll try your way or we'll take your note or you know that is always a struggle is trying to know how much to fight and how much to kind of bend to the authority and try to work with that whole system i find it i not find it that's one of the, the hardest parts and you know and certainly in terms of with your creative staff uh, yeah, you've got this idea, but at the same time, you have to be open to fresh ideas that are coming along because that's also what elevates it. I mean, that's one thing exciting about working with a big group of creative people is it really does, you know, it comes together and it kind of spirals up and it always gets better than where you started off. That's at least my experience. Rob, for you? Um, well, you know, as, as far as that sort of being flexible or not flexible, you kind of have to, um, it, it's, it's a tightrope. So you really have to be firm, you know, because ultimately, you know, as a director, your, your, your job is to be a leader, right? And just kind of a generic sort of thing. You know, you have to lead people. What does that mean? You have to inspire confidence. You know, you have, that's, that's, a, that's a huge critical thing, which, can be the undoing of many people that aspire to be directors, but have a tough time with some of the more challenging aspects of it. And as you said, being flexible is key. And as Roger pointed out, you know, when you're when you're in a in a studio situation where you've got people who have their role is to be a guide above the director, um, but you, you can't always rely on them and, uh, to, to have the right idea or, or a good idea even. It's not something that's a given, you know. What, when it's functional, those people actually are aware of that and they say, I'm not, I don't want you to do, don't do what I say if by doing that, you're actually gonna make the movie worse or, you know, it's gonna be a problem. And we had a, and a good balanced situation where Peter Schneider specifically would say, if you don't agree with something that just got said to you as a note, you can't just ignore or deny it, or you can't not do something because the note was given for a reason. It may, the idea may not have been the right idea, uh, but, but, the, but usually there's something underneath the idea or something underneath the note that is actually relevant and that you need to look at and address and you need to say, okay, now is your opportunity to say, let's, let's kick the tires on that and let's see if maybe it could be better. Maybe let's, let's open it up again. So oftentimes, you know, you would get a note and sometimes very specific, but you would say, okay, I don't think that's gonna be the way we do it. But then you would have a chance to kind of refashion it. And then when you presented that back, you'd say, here's, here's how we address the note. It may not have come, it may have been an entirely new thing, but you have to be able to endorse it. You have to be able to sign off on it or, or attach your name to it. Meaning it's what's hard is that you always are required to do what you believe in, right? You, you, can, never, you can never just do something because somebody said it and you, you know, do it slavishly, especially if it was a bad idea or a mistake because that person would come back and say, this is terrible. And you can't say, well, that was your idea. Yeah. You can't. That's like the rules of the game. You can never say that. You can always, just, you just go, oh, well, all right, we'll, we'll try yeah, that again. That happens a lot too. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so if you really don't believe, you don't necessarily leave the meeting with a clear idea of what to do, you still have to sit down and kind of mull it over and try to figure out, first of all, so, so an, 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 an an ability to analyze problems becomes very critical, very key, because you have to start to kind of decipher. So you literally find yourself, you're kind of digging down underneath the surface into the deeper layers of meaning and personality and character and psychology. And you're like, because you have to find the thing. You say, what, where did this come from? And sometimes it's not obvious and you have to kind of dig down to figure it out. And when you do, you go, oh, here, this is what it is. And you go, oh, that's what it is. Oh, that's so much clearer. Now I think I understand what, what was being said or what was being me meant by it. And, and th that gives you an opportunity to kind of figure it out. Because sometimes it's like, you know, you're, you're 
doing surgery on a on a living patient, right? You don't want to kill your patient on the on the on the table, on the operating table. You want to keep your patient alive. So as you're forced to poke and prod it and stick needles in and do all these kind of crazy things, or like, you know, you're doing open heart surgery or brain surgery, you're you're you know, you you have to keep your patient alive. So you have to be very careful. Well, there, it strikes me that you, you've got to walk a fine line with uh, too many cooks in the room, people wanting to get their fingerprints on it, or is, is there a level of diplomacy? Is there a level of, how do you balance that with, within a, a project Diploma at any given point? Yeah. Diplomacy, Diplomacy is key. <laughs> <laughs> well, which means you have to have a good command of language, honestly. You really have to be able to articulate things in a way that is, you know, sometimes it's not going to be inflammatory to the, right. to the people that you're, you're explaining things to that, that tends to be kind of the way around because everybody in the process, absolutely. Everybody has a point of view. Everybody has a, their own mind and their own heart and their own feelings and their own et whatever. And you have to respect that in everybody. And you have to be careful, you know, that you're not sort of hurting someone's feelings unintentionally when maybe you don't agree with their point of view or you don't like their idea or you don't, well, you know, whatever it is, you know, you have something to say. Now, again, as artists, you know, I think again, we, we were probably all given some good training, literally in high school. I remember, you know, in my experience at CalArts, we had a great teacher named Bill Moore who has talked about widely among a group of people that did study with him. He was one of the most he was endlessly amusing, but he was also an incredibly critical person who had very, very strong ideas and strong opinions. And he literally would, it was almost like he would, if he didn't like what you did or if it, he didn't you know, think that you understood what you did, he would just slice you into ribbons in front of the class and had no problem doing that. And you know, what was interesting is that people, some people couldn't survive that. Some people just, said, you know what, I, I can't handle this and left the classes. And you know what he would say in response to that? I did them a favor. I did them a favor because they're gonna confront this in their work and in their life going forward in their careers. And if they can't handle it, then they shouldn't be doing this because it can be very difficult. It can be emotionally very difficult. When you, when you do something and people don't love it, you know, cause we all want people to love everything we do and that's not the way it works. So you have to be able to handle those kinds of disappointments and frustrations and all of that. And, you know, you sort of keep, keep marching forward. Roger, any lessons from your end on, on uh, along those lines? Uh, well, there's not a whole lot to add to what Rod just said. Again, it's, <laughs> it's like you do, you have, to, you have to respect the people who are disagreeing with you. That is what uh, comes what comes forward, and and I remember one session I was uh, working with a, a producer, and uh, it, it was things were tough, uh, but I was trying to get this story approved so things could move forward. And she came in after a night of considering about things with a huge list of everything that was wrong. Right, so. You know, I could feel it right away that the, the, the attention was, you know, there was tension in the room. There was, you know, she was probably nervous also about, you know, bringing in all of these, these critical demands and things. And I just decided at the beginning of that meeting, I went, okay, I'm going to have to empty out all my emotion, you know, just exhale that. And I just concentrated on listening to her and projecting acceptance. I decided... I can listen to things that she's saying and disagree, but I am going to project from my heart, you know, that I absolutely accept her and value her, and, you know, just pure positive energy towards her, which was like a, practically like a meditative uh, exercise. And it's, it is really much an exercise, you know, when it's coming at you. But what's really interesting is as we went through all these notes and everything and discussed things, because I really concentrated on that, the, the, the energy came down in the room and it evened out and we could discuss, you know, possible other ways of looking at it. And then I remember we, we moved into another room where the, the whole story was up on big beat boards 
And by the time we started into that, the whole mood had changed and we were talking about different ideas and we were laughing and joking and the whole tenor had changed. And I just thought, all right, this is, this really works, <laughs> you know, and who wouldn't rather be in that situation where you can talk about your project and talk about ideas about it and be friends and laugh, you know, there's a, for one thing, you, it's very hard to be creative when you're angry or feeling threatened and all that sort of thing. Everything, you know, tightens up inside of you. It is like the antithesis of being creative, you know? So that whole thing of trying to uh, let go of everything uh, is a really interesting, I mean, it's kind of like a life lesson anyway, just yeah. doesn't have to be about making movies, <laughs> you know, but I think you know, kind of breathing it out and letting it out and letting the other person be and letting them know that they're okay, you know, that they're okay. I mean, there's so much to the environment, creating a, you know, fostering, supportive, collaborative, enjoyable, fun uh, environment. Now, I know you guys had that kind of challenge uh, heading into Lion King where there were a lot of, there was a lot underestimated about that project. And when you came on board, um, what kinds of things uh, were you able to do or that just sort of organically came about that helped to, to turn the tide a bit on that? Um, it was sort of the, the, the uh, oh, the other project where everyone was focusing on what on Pocahontas and other projects right. on your way. Yeah. How did you keep that going? How did you keep I mean, it? I I think that the, the, what happened, and it wasn't by design, but what happened was because Lion King was very unconventional in terms of what had been done at Disney previously and uh, other projects, specifically Pocahontas was kind of made in a, in a, in a fashion around a kind of a genre, you know, it was a princess movie in a sense, you know, sort of, and, and that had been done a number of times very successfully. Um, and so, the problem with that can be that you that you end up codifying what works or what becomes kind of the 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 formula for why that should or would work and there wasn't a formula on lion king there wasn't so nobody was an expert on it nobody knew actually knew what would what it should be and it was on us and and it was a great opportunity because we literally and we would joke about this while we were doing it we were like we're going to try everything including the kitchen sink like there was no holds barred it was like, I don't, whatever, whatever could, it could be a crazy thing or it wouldn't make any sense for these two things to be together, but it didn't matter because we were gonna, because nobody was telling us it had to be like that. So, so yeah. Yeah. it is funny too, because the movie wound up, if you look at all like the musical numbers and everything, they're all so different one from the other. I mean, they could actually almost be from different movies. Yeah. You know, I can't wait to be king is totally different, you know, than be prepared or circle of life. You know, well, they all had such different moods and some of them we were actually even quoting other kinds of films like Be Prepared. We were looking at Lenny Reifenstahl, you know, with her Triumph of the Will Nazi films and things. Uh, you know, yeah. so. Which by the way. <laughs> they couldn't uh, be more way, different. What? That, and, and talk about the creative process. So we had done a version of Be Prepared and it was okay. It was okay, but it wasn't quite great. And we all felt that it wasn't quite great. And then we uh, went to Jorn Klubin's cubicle or wherever his desk went, and he had a board of drawings behind him. And I don't even know if we were in a meeting or what, but there was one little drawing that he had done, just one <laughs> tiny little drawing of Scar with a little Hitler mustache. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, hey, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting, hmm. That's an interesting <laughs> idea. That could be, yeah. And then we like triumph of the will and be prepared. Well, that sounds like a good, because that's, again, that's where you're trying to find. You're, you're sort of oftentimes hybridizing things. You know, you're like, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you put it together and you get something new. And, and, and yet you want each thing to have its own unique kind of integrity or design concept. You know, it has to have a concept where you say, oh, that concept is strong enough to contain a song because otherwise it can be very, you know, it doesn't have a personality or character or it doesn't kind of entertain the audience enough. So they, it needs to have something. And so when, you're, when it's not yet there, you sort of, you know it. You're like, oh, it's, it's okay, it's not great. I don't know, it needs something. 
and you try to keep pushing the idea until you can kind of, until it, you know, it, ha it becomes unique and has its own identity. Ever push an idea too far? Often. I'm sure. But that's kind of, well, we, we had an idea for uh, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, which we all <laughs> thought was, you know, again, this was like, well, we want to be different. Like, we're, we're not going to do it the same way as everybody else. And we're like, this love song, we're like, it's not really a love story. It's really this coming of age story. It's a story about Simba and his father more than it is about Simba and Nala. And we're like, maybe we should try something radically different, you know? So we thought, let's have Timon and Pumbaa sing the song, which will be funny. <laughs> and so we, we recorded because Nathan. They weren't Nathan. happy about the love affair. So they were singing a love song from two people who weren't happy about what was but, going yeah, on. Yeah, so there was an <laughs> ironic, because we were looking forward to have a unique kind of thing. And so we recorded uh, Nathan and Ernie singing the whole song. We did the whole storyboard to Nathan and Ernie. And then we brought it to Atlanta and showed Elton John and he had a fit. He was like, you <laughs> ruined my song. I can't believe he said, the reason I did this movie is because I always wanted to write a classic Disney love song and you've ruined it. And we're like, oh God, Oops. he's right. He's right. We, so that was for sure a moment where we took it too far. Yeah. He also offered a really good reason. He said, you know, remember, this is the story about this whole, you know, cycle and of Simba's life and his time as a king. And he needs to have a mate, and they need to produce the next heir. And he, that it is important that he and Nala come together and emotionally. He said, "This is actually it's essential for your movie." And we went, "Yep, you're right." <laughs> he was right. But so, but here was the thing about when you try something, we may never have had the the opening and the ending, which is Timon and Pumbaa. That, that came out of the idea that we just said, let's let them sing the whole song. But then we ended up saying, well, it kind of works that they introduce the song and it works that they close the song at, from the mm -hmm. sto story perspective. And so that, that was actually something that we gained from going too far or, or, or not, you know, again, that's the kind of case where you say, it may be a terrible idea, but you should try it, you know, because you might learn something from it. Have any of these terrible ideas worked well? turned out to be qualitative ideas? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, I think just- Lion King was a terrible idea, I think was the first <laughs> The whole movie was a terrible idea. The whole movie was a terrible idea. <laughs> that worked out. <laughs> so it's worth pursuing those once in a while, right? Yeah. yeah. To your point, Rob, about how uh, the discovery of that is there, uh, how much room do you, do you leave open or are you granted even in, in some instances for discovery? And well, like I said, you know, if you're, you know, it, being in a situation where there were fewer rules or fewer, you know, <laughs> kind of codified ideas helps because then you have no alternative, you know, you just, but the truth is, is that, you know, I, the thing about making a movie is that every movie is, is, is different. And the truth is, if you, if you're caught copying another movie, the audience knows it and generally speaking, doesn't like it. So the movie, so movies in a sense are, you know, I kind of like to think of them as like pop songs, right? So a pop song for it to work has all of the ingredients of a song. It's got a verse and a chorus and it's got an intro and maybe a bridge and, and it has these chord progressions and all of them have been used before, but it has to do it somehow differently. It has to do it somehow uniquely and, and freshly so that you go, oh, that's, it's, look at that. That's kind of an, it's a great new work. Right, so you always have to find a way to be inventive and creative and do something that's fresh and new while working inside of a form that's very, very specific. You know, we, we make movies that are three acts, for instance. They don't have to be, they just are. And, you know, we've just grown accustomed to that structure, right? You have a setup in the first act and then you have to turn into your second act and you have to blow and all these things are like, okay, those are your, you have to hit those moments for it to kind of function as a movie. Um, but they have to do it in a way that doesn't feel repetitive or redundant or unoriginal. And you mentioned a bit, and for both of you to talk a little bit about the audience, the importance of the audience as you're working through a, a story, developing a film, is always forefront in, in your mind? Um, are you, are you, writing to the audience, playing to the audience? Um, is it more about your creative vision? Talk about the role of, of like Hitchcock always talked about, you know, you've got to work it 
you have to stay ahead of the audience. Um, talk a little bit as directors on the importance of the audience to the experience here. I think mostly what we did, certainly in our time working together at Disney and all of that, we, we were mainly pleasing ourselves. I have to say, <laughs> yeah, we were seeing if us the and the story just... crew, if if it felt good to us, did it make us laugh? Did it make us cry? Did it, you know, were, were we moved by it? I think that was always primarily our, our main focus because for one thing, the audience, I mean, you do have to, you know, you do have, you have to think about the audience and, and you do, but I, I always, I think I always felt like we were enough of an audience for the most part um, to start structuring everything. And then of course, you know, when you're a little bit further on and then you start showing it to large group screenings at the studio or even taking it out to real audiences for test runs you do get back some really interesting feedback, but uh, yeah, I would have to say we were mainly pleasing ourselves. I don't know, wouldn't you say, Ron? Yes, absolutely. I think you know um, when I when I was a first year Cal Arts student, I uh, got to meet and become friends with Chuck Jones, who was one of the great animation directors, and that was the probably the first question that we asked him. It's like, well, who did you did you, did you make these cartoons for kids? Because I think at the time maybe they had become kind of stuff for kids, but, but we always felt that there was something more sophisticated about them. And so we asked about that and he, and he said, oh God, absolutely not. We never made it, we never thought about it. kids. And he said, frankly, we never thought about anybody but ourselves. Like we wanted to make ourselves laugh and we thought it was funny, we would, we would do it. So I think that that spirit sort of got carried forward, which is the, the better way to go because if you are too married to the audience, you know, you, you're chasing after something that you probably can never succeed at because you do have to be ahead of the audience. You know, you have to, you have to be in front. And it's one of the interesting things about storytelling specifically and about filmmaking is that you have an idea. You say, oh, this is the idea. And then you got to figure out how to express the idea. And one of the most important things is that you cannot embody or contain the idea in the text or in the substance. The idea actually has to exist and a level in the subtext, in a level below the text. And so you're always wrestling because you say, I, I'm trying to express this thing that the audience is gonna understand, but I can't over explain it. I can't do it through exposition. I can't tell them what they're supposed to feel. I can't, I can't do it. I have got to find, you have to find a way so that when it hits the audience, the audience goes, oh. Yeah. They get it like, oh, and that's the struggle that we're all part, you know, participating in. It's like figuring out, finding a way to, to express the idea, but in an indirect way. Yeah. Well, you, we've all seen movies where you, you, you feel the, the input of, you know, I hate to say it, but like, you know, certain groups or overseeing groups and they, they insist, you can see where it happens and you can just see where it's been planted where they have to overemphasize and over, you know, illustrate what the thing is about. And sometimes it, they make them into catchphrases and, and they pound it into your head throughout the whole movie. And it, you know, it just, it drives me crazy. And I'm sure the audience is intelligent enough that they'll get it without having it force fed to them all the time. You know, the best, the best writers, you know, create a world, create the characters, and you become involved in them, and you care about them, and you see what their struggles are, and you understand what it's about. You don't have to have the character come out and say, you know what this is really about? It's, it's all about the defamation of the individual, or whatever, you know, whatever you want to make up, and, you know, and they pound it over again. It's like, no, no, let it be, let it breathe. I also, I, I often hate preambles, you know, like introductions to the movies where you have to have a written thing that gets you ready or someone, some narrator has to bring you up to speed. It's just like, who has a narrator in their life? You know, we get plunged into situations and yet we figure out what's going on pretty quickly. I love things that just start and you're in it and you basically have to catch up through what's happening and then you learn who's who. Well, and that's a great point, you know, getting a little too heavy handed with the message or the lines. Um, I'm always telling my students to go out and get your money back if that's the case, if it's too obvious, if the answer is too, too apparent right there. But um, 
what kinds of things let's let's talk about some of those examples of what not to be doing in in terms of storytelling there's equally important things to learn there you know not getting too heavy-handed what what would you not do for a character to um, uh, make the storyline to you know to to lose empathy for the character or um, have you ever had examples that is, that's a great point you know that that's always a struggle actually in in storytelling because we often worry about uh, the audience identifying with a character or liking a character and it does make it very difficult to, to actually tell a story if unless your character does something wrong <laughs> the character sort of needs to do something wrong and to make the story happen right because yeah. obviously they have to they they're, they're going to grow or learn or change through the course of the storytelling you know they got to start somewhere and it, and it's a tightrope and and you can you can be guilty of doing I, either right you can either alienate the audience from your character possibly and that can have a negative effect or you can uh, you can protect your character by, by not allowing him to do something that would be an unlikable thing oh that would, the, the audience won't like him but that but then you're robbing yourself and your audience of stories where you know where the characters where there might be actually something uh, more challenging for the audience to kind of take on but you know, you you look at Lion King as a good example. Simba, as a as a as an undeveloped cub, is doing all sorts of terrible, irresponsible things. But we still like him because we like his energy and his spirit and his confidence. And you know, um, and he gets to gives him an opportunity to learn a lesson. You know, later in the movie. Um, but there are you know, there are other other films where you know those kinds of things weren't done, you know, and then in, in the service of trying to make your characters relatable or, or, you know, or good, but then it can end up being very bland. Roger, any instances from your work? Hmm. Oh, let me think. <laughs> While thinking on that. Yeah, well, it's interesting because, I, you know, right now I am, I'm working on a, a, a musical for the stage and one of the things I'm actually still working with, trying to work out is, is that whole thing about a character. I like the idea that this character is making kind of, there's something essential in his nature, which is kind of negative, gets him into a lot of trouble, but at the same time, I want to celebrate it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm treading a really thin line because you know you want, as Rob was saying, you want your character to grow in some way. and. And one of the messages I'm trying to say in this story is I don't want this thing that sort of makes him alive crushed out of him. You know what I mean? That it's about a, you know, an individual against a societal pressure. Uh, and so I don't know. So it, right now I'm engaged in the middle of something where I'm trying to figure out that balance, you know? So to me, I'm hoping that this, this character who, who always does this kind of what we might call a wrong thing is actually something to be admired. I don't know. We'll see if this works or not. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about how it, this almost this this process of pondering and and the development of these ideas. Some things take a bit of time, uh, and then other times you've got deadlines to work on. How do you fully flush out a character or a story when you've got a a deadline <laughs> facing you? It's, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think for me, deadlines are a great motivator. So, you know, with, with no deadline, you can work on something forever, you know, potentially, just because it can be endlessly interesting to kind of, yeah. you know, but, but if you have a deadline, it sort of puts you into the, into the pressure cooker. So, you know, sort of like the, the diamonds come from the pressure, you know, um, so I don't know. I think deadlines have always been a, a, a good thing for me. It you know, kind of gets, kind of gets you up in the morning. You're like, I yeah. gotta finish this thing. It's, <laughs> that was true. It's so funny that that would happen. At, I remember uh, at Cal Arts, you know, <laughs> you know, you would you, Wednesdays were our design assignment days, and invariably people would leave it till Tuesday to start yeah. their thing. And generally speaking, you would be up till two, three, four in the morning finishing your design work and then you'd have to be showing up 
you know, at 8 a.m. to like go through it with the, with the teacher. So everyone was, <laughs> came in sleep deprived on Wednesday mornings, but you know, it, but it was that the rush and excitement of, I've got, you know, I've got to get this thing done for tomorrow. And quite often in a story pitch, you're doing the same thing. You're like, the pitch is Friday and it's Thursday. And you're like, we're not finished. We've got to finish this thing. And it's got to be great because this pitch is a kind of a make or break thing. It's either going to live or die based on how this goes. And so often people are working late into the evenings on those night befores to get the thing up and running and ready to go. Nature of the beast. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to open it up. I see we're getting some questions and uh, lots of really great response about uh, the interaction here. Uh, Matt, if you're there, I'm going to let you moderate these. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and jump into these questions in the Q&A. Right. I see you guys already answered a few of them. Um, let's go with this one here. It feels like directors in animation do just the directing in most mainstream cases. But is it possible for directors to contribute cre creatively to the projects they're directing in other ways, like storyboards, character designs, or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. yeah. absolutely. I mean, you know, before you become a director, typically, typically, you've gone through, especially in animation, you go through the process and you're a storyboard artist or you're an animator or you're you're doing actually something else. So you didn't you didn't start out by being a director. Um, and so, you know, whatever those skills are that you've acquired through the process of your career, you will bring to bear in the, in the pro whatever project you're working on. Yeah, I mean, certainly in working on design, just in the room when you're, you know, your designer is presenting some different ideas, the best way to talk about things like that is visually. So a lot of times you're called, you know, the best thing is to respond with a drawing. Well, you know, what if this shape, we sort of move the shape, you know what I mean? So a lot of it, uh, yeah, you, you're still involved in that sort of thing. You're still contributing and you're using your own skills. Um, Would that vary from project to project where perhaps in an animated situation, you can step up and, and visually show that, but in live action, are you sitting right. and mm -hmm. drawing out your storyboards and, and or acting the part out in a way that you want to see intended? I mean, does that, um, you know, you're, I mean, you, you use your, your skill set. It, you can use it in different ways, you know? Um, but it, it was, I, but I do recall very distinctly when working with Hugh Laurie on Stuart Little, he would always remark about the fact that I couldn't erase his eyebrows, even if I wanted to. <laughs> 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 Great, I love it. Um, Matt, let's keep going with questions. Yeah, we have a question here that's asking, uh, can each of you give adv some advice to a beginner who is aiming to become a director, but is confused between directing and production management? Confused, uh, the meaning of the word confused, meaning they're trying to decide whether they wanna go into production management or being a director. Uh, they're so vastly different, I can't even, I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, there's, these are, these are two totally different worlds. Uh, production management is, a, is, is that it's management, meaning, you know, it's about schedules. It's about uh, quotas. It's, it's a lot of number crunching. It's a lot of, you know, uh, so it's, it's, it's a left, I would say, relatively speaking, a much more left brain kind of a pursuit. Whereas directing is, it's not, not left brain, but it is much, much more right brain. So if you, if you're going into production management, I would think that your right brain is not necessarily the thing that you're doing a lot of in your life. That, that I would think that would be the natural thing. If you find yourself creating and, and interested in ideas and, and exploring the world and all that, then directing would make better sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Good answer. Let's keep going, Matt. Oh, yeah. Uh, we sorry, this uh, next question is coming from a, a little lad. I hope I pronounced her name right. Uh, Tony Bancroft. Uh, he says, hi, guys. I enjoyed working with both of you on The Lion King, uh, but you guys are very different from one another. What was the process of you two being put together for this film? Was there a learning curve for your partnership? <laughs> it's funny because we had not really worked together on anything before. I think 
I was storyboarding on Little Mermaid while Rob was doing some animation for a while, but that what didn't really bring us together. We knew each other, but we hadn't worked together. So we were thrown together and was boom, all of a sudden, okay, the clock's ticking, go. <laughs> so- That was interesting. We, we actually- had you, relationship. Had you, we, who thought that up though? Had you, was that a Peter Schneider or Jeffrey Katzenberg or was that, who was it? who said, you know, these two guys might have a mix here. I think, I think Don might have been instrumental. Um, go ahead, Ron. No, no, no. I, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, it's sort of in, in, our, in our life tracks or our career tracks, I was sort of moving towards directing, right? As a separate thing. So I'd started as an, in the animation department as an animator. Um, early on, Peter Schneider asked me specifically, like, what, it, what are your career goals? Like, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to direct. And he was like, I, that's very important that you told me that because now I can, I can help you with that. And it took a very long time to go from that first conversation to directing them for, you know, the Roger Rabbit shorts that were done after the, uh, after the feature, which Don produced, Don Hunt produced. Um, but I'd worked in development before that. I'd been a writer. I'd pitched some projects and sold some original ideas and then, you know, got the chance to write a, a number of screenplays. Um, but my track was as a director. So I was, so that was kind of a thing. And I, I, I don't know exactly how Roger went from being a story artist to directing. I don't know. I wasn't, I don't know. I wasn't in that conversation, but I think that I was sort of in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a track which made me a, a, a viable or a likely candidate when there was an opening. That, that's what I think it was. I don't think it was by design. Is that well, the key, Roger? Well, uh, no, I, uh, I, I had, uh, when I started Disney, I was always uh, working as a story, story artist. And um, on Beauty and the Beast, I was head of story and working a lot with uh, Howard Ashman and, uh, Alan Menken and being very instrumental. And a lot of people were starting to say to me, oh, you know, you should direct, you should direct. And I always thought, oh my God, you direct and then you've lost, you know, your private life, you know, your time goes and, you know, I had a family and, but you know, like a little devil in your ear and the more people who kept saying, you should direct. So then I started, well, it would be interesting, you know? So I remember commenting to Peter Schneider one day, uh, well, I'm sort of interested in directing, you know, and said, oh, okay, well, I'll chew on that idea. And then uh, Lion King, which first was being directed by another person who I had yeah. worked with earlier, uh, they wanted to team him up with someone. So they asked me and I was already focused on developing another project. And I was going, no, no, I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, and, and Jeffrey Katzenberg said, basically, do it. <laughs> so I went on there and then uh, worked, worked with the other director for a while then he was taken off and then they brought Rob on so all of it was uh, I mean it was intentional for me to direct but it sure. was just wanting to try it out but when, uh, when Roger and I started I, we, we had a, a very you know functional conversation early on about how we were planning to work together because there were different ways that it had been done before so, you know, we could sort of reference John, you know, Ron, uh, John Musk and Ron Clements as a team of directors that had worked previously and other people. And it wasn't a one size fits all thing. And, the, and we have sort of left to us and we said, well, let's, let's do it this way. So we decided that through the story process, we would be partners, right? That we would both get to agree on each sequence, every sequence. After that, they were done through story and they went into production, we decided we were going to be independent as directors on sequences and that we would get the final say on the sequences we were directing. However, the other person would be a gadfly in the editing room and could always and should always give advice or criticism or suggestions uh, through the process. And that's kind of how we did it. So, so the story, pro story process, we sort of were shoulder to shoulder and then in the sequence directing, we kind of worked more independently. And that was, for us, it was functional. You know, for us, it worked. And, you know, we, and sometimes we had our disagreements, you know, but, but, you know, we figured out a way to get through them. Yeah, I, I think one of the things was 
that basically I think we were really fortunate that our tastes were very similar. You know, I, you know, definitely our personalities are very different, but I think our tastes are very similar. And I think that was, that was a uh, really lucky thing about our partnership. Uh, you know, we had similar sense of humor. We enjoyed music in, in the same way. So I think in that way, it made a lot of the decision making so much easier. You know, I, yes, of course, we disagreed at times. Uh, and, you know, when you'd see the other scene, you go, hmm, well, I wouldn't have done it like that, or it would be better like that. But uh, I think for the most part, we, you know, we respected each other's domains in terms of, of the animation, but we always came together, as Rob said, in story and also in the, uh, the look of the film. So uh, art direction wise, that also, we, we did it as a, as a duo. So that kept, kept, you know, story and the look of the film was unified. So um, I think- Were there, uh, was, was there a little kind of growing time of growth where you had to figure out each other's strengths, weaknesses, um, you, know, you know? I think both of us at that point in our careers had done enough you know what I mean? Like we had our own personalities were sort of developed, right? And our careers had developed. And so we, both of us had done enough work previously that we were kind of coming into it more as journeymen than as novices, even though we neither of us had directed before, but we were, you know, we, we were just like, this is, you know, we're, we're just coming at it and trying to do the best we can. Part of the, the thing was, is that, you know, we were in a, in a, you know, we, the Lion King came in a series of successes, right? There was the Little Mermaid, uh, obviously it was a massive kind of watershed for the studio, uh, Beauty and the Beast, obviously, and then Aladdin were huge, not only hits, but they were great films. And, and then suddenly we had the, we were shouldering this movie, which was the movie that not everybody wanted to work on, or no, people didn't believe in the movie or whatever it was, you know, it just, you know, it happened to be that project. And so Roger and I were, we knew, we felt very keenly that we had to push it further and prove ultimately that it was worth something because we would have, you know, in a variety of pitch meetings where you, you would expect, you know, we would go to the studio, um, the, the people at the top level of, you know, marketing and distribution and, and, and all of that stuff. And we were like, here's the movie. And then the meeting would end and they were like, and they'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, what's, uh, what's this, it's not really based on anything, is it? No, I don't know, I'm not sure about this. And you know, you f we felt that every day on the project that this was something people didn't really believe in. And we just worked like hell to get it, to keep pushing it uphill, you know? <laughs> And man, we managed to get it to the top of the hill, but it was just by a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat and a lot of, you know, just not giving up. Mm -hmm. It seemed like we were always behind time. It always seemed like, oh, we're running out of time <laughs> the whole time. Didn't it yeah. feel like that, Rob? <laughs> always. Yeah. Uh, what what kinds of lessons have you taken from that? I mean, I mean, what an incredible entract your your first foray out into directing. Um, what lessons have you taken from that and applied to the various projects you've done since? Hmm. What lessons? Well, for one thing, you just never know where something's going to end up. You can't know the future of things. Um, you know, the film I worked on right after that, uh, developing it, an original idea, I worked on for four years and then it got shelved. So that was like the exact reverse of what the Lion King uh, path was. So um, you, you do, I guess you just have to be not attached to the outcome in a way, you know? Uh, and that's kind of the creative process anyway, is you, you work on things, you give your heart to it, you throw your energy into it, you try to enjoy it, you know? but you can't be too attached to the outcome because there is no way of knowing. There is no way of knowing. Uh, and that, it seems like a contradiction to be able to devote yourself so much to something and then try to remain unattached to the outcome. But there is some sort of balance there. And that's, I guess, the thing that I've learned over time is, uh, yeah, trying to maintain that, that sense of 
let it be what it will, <laughs> you know, and, but, you know, certainly from our experience on Lion King, meeting people all over the world and how their response to it is, is so huge. And that is like, I mean, it's a very moving thing. It's a very touching thing for people, you know, for me, I'm sure for Rob, you know, when you see people and it meant so much to them and, and it, it, that it went so far, I mean, and it's also, you know, it's, it's not just us, it's everybody who worked on the film, certainly, you know, Tony who snuck his little question in there. Hello, Tony, um, you know, all these people who contributed to it, you know, it's, it's, it's really wonderful that they get to know that, you know, what they can do can have that sort of effect all over. And it's a nice, a nice thing to have done and leave behind too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite a turning point. Rob, for you, what kinds of things have you applied from your experiences on Lion King to future uh, projects beyond that? Um, I, I, it's, I, I don't have, it's, I'm, I'm usually not at a loss for words, but I don't really have a specific <laughs> thing. <laughs> not a specific thing. I mean, it, it's... Yeah. Because it's not about, I mean, I guess it's, it's not necessarily about the, the, the project, which of course, when we were making it, you know, didn't feel like it was going to be, or, you know, not didn't feel, but it, but we were battling an, you know, kind of an uphill mm. battle um, to get it there. And the truth is, honestly, that's my experience on absolutely every project I've ever worked on. It's always an uphill battle. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just, it is, you're just always, there's always something kind of in the way. There's always obstacles and challenges and problems and frustrations and difficulties. And the, the truth is, is that you, no matter what day it is or what project you're working on, you just always have to kind of come at it with some, with, a, with an enthusiasm, not necessarily born of anything, but hopeless optimism. <laughs> that's the stuff we all need <laughs> that's a little bit like a like a turn uh, turn on the, what was it henry david thoreau's thing most men live lives of you know quiet desperation years and most uh, directors live lives of hopeless Hopeful optimism <laughs> i think we need a lot of that these days which is great i appreciate yes, you know what that's what's interesting isn't it you know just uh not everyone may, sh may share the same response to recent events, but you know, for me, it was like, wow, there is, you know, there you can still be optimistic, you know, and things can, mm. can happen in, in the darkest of times. I, it is wonderful. It is good to have your optimism refired every so often, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes. And I think as storytellers and creatives, that's our primary role. Yes. Yeah. Matt, yeah. let's set up two more questions I'm seeing go by. Yeah, this next question is asking. How do you come across as a team player? And also how can you gauge how to tailor different personalities on the team to have good communication? Well, wow. the, fir the first way to come across as a team player if you're at, if, is there's no job that is below you. There's no nothing, there's no job that, you know, you say, oh, I, that's not, you know, I can't do that. What, no matter what it is, it doesn't matter. If somebody says you need to go out and get some lunch for the crew, you do that. If they say, you know, whatever, you, you got to pick, pick, put the, all the story, you know, the, 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 you know, the pins away in a, in a thing you do, you know, like being a team player means being up for whatever the task is at hand. And so people can rely on you uh, in, in any circumstance because they know you're going to pitch in, you know, no matter what. I think, I think one of the things is also just really acknowledging everybody's contribution uh, and that it's all essential. I mean, maybe that's what you're, the same thing you're saying, Rob, but it's, it's just like acknowledging everybody you're working with. You know, not, you, you can't stride into the room and start delivering pronouncements and all of that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's being aware of what people are doing. And that's actually hard to do sometimes. Sometimes you're working with hundreds of people and it is hard to know what everybody's doing, but as much as you can uh, to understand, you know, what people are, are, are contributing and, and knowing that I, probably everybody's working really hard. You know what? Uh, every, every, every kind of job is, you know, people are, are putting in the time and putting in the energy and just giving the acknowledgement, you know, all the way along. I think people can feel sometimes like they're, 
the unseen worker, you know, uh, the person who's in the meeting taking the notes can be very invisible because they're not the ones speaking, but you know, it's, it's just good to remember everybody. We had a great uh, experience at Disney, you know, back in the early days of doing a retreat, a creative retreat, and they brought Pat Riley, uh, who was coaching the Lakers at the time. And he talked about Magic Johnson and said, Magic Johnson is the epitome of a team player because he's the most, he's the most talented, but he's also the most generous player out there. He says he's always looking out for his teammates. He's always shoveling the ball to a teammate rather than taking all the shots himself. And that's, you know, that's what made him a great team player. Well, and to your point uh, earlier, Rob, about kind of thinking on it as an orchestra and everybody, you know, unifying the ability to unify that sound towards one ultimate end goal is as a conductor is pretty unique, but um, recognizing the importance of each section and each individual within that section also key. Um, how do you, when you've got a giant ship of several hundred people, how do you keep that energy and uh, focus and uh, momentum going as a director? That, that is important. Certainly producer has a hand on that as well. But as a director, how do you keep your, your team uh, on board and following your vision? For me, it's I mean, the, the most important thing is laughter. You know, that, that if the crew is laughing, then, you know, it's, they're a happier crew because it's, it's always tough. It's always challenging. It's always difficult. You're battling a deadline. There's too much work. There's not enough time and it's, and it's tough. But if everybody is sort of enjoying the camaraderie of the experience, then, you know, then people's moods and, uh, are, are better than, than when they get dark, which they can if they feel that there's too much oppression you know, which there easily can be. And it does happen quite often where, there, where the environment becomes oppressive mm -hmm. and, and you're still expected to show up and do your job and deliver great results. But if the environment is oppressive, it can be a real, a real torture. Yeah, I think, you know, Don Hahn is a master producer in that, in his understanding of, of keeping spirits up. And he would always find excuses for a little celebration. It's... Uh, what's the German uh, uh, drinking festival? Oktoberfest. Oktoberfest. Hey, and so he set up an Oktoberfest in the in the pod around his office, and everyone would come in for a beer and sausage. Yeah. Or so, you know, any excuse, and it really helped. It really helps, and it keeps people light, and uh, you know, yes. it, it starts feeling not just like a factory where you're punching in and you're cranking away, but you know, people need that kind of blow up steam and. I remember one of the things I loved about Disney, especially in the smaller days when I started there, when it was a smaller place, where at break times, people going out with their like their little uh, mechanical cars and zooming them around in the parking lots and Halloweens where people came in in costume. I just, for one thing, animators are, are such a creative bunch. It's really fun when they're able to do fun, you know, silly stuff, you know, and uh, exercise that and play pranks mm -hmm. on each other. Yeah, uh, that's the sort of thing I've always felt. I remember us doing in the uh, Little Mermaid trailer, we were working in a trailer. And I remember Mark Dindle and Kelly Asbury and me and we were all on the like, we were having chair races, these chairs with the wheels on the bottom. I mean, we were, the, the trailers were put together in kind of a rectangular hallway. And we were zooming around the hallway in our in our chairs on our wheels, you know, having a race. You have to do that to kind of blow off steam sometimes. And keep the creativity moving. Um, do you Sorry. do anything to, to do that? In fact, you've, you talked about um, research trips and travel for inspiration. What do, you, what do you do to keep your artists and yourselves inspired? Yeah, that's, that's tricky because a lot of times there isn't time to do much in the way of trips and things like that, you know, with, with deadlines and all. I mean, you, you sort of, to some extent, you, you, you really hope and expect that the artists to do it for themselves, that they've learned mm -hmm. that that's an important part of, of the job, which is to kind of recharge your battery, right? So you can't all just be feeding into the machine. You've got to feed yourself and so anybody that, you know, 
whether they paint or whether they go out and draw, do life drawing, but just for themselves, you know, they're just doing it because they enjoy it or go see a movie or go to the, go to the museum or whatever it is, you know, go to go have a hike in nature. And that a lot of, most everyone, again, who have like longevity in the business, they know how to kind of keep themselves, you know, fed so you can sort of get through they nourish themselves so that you can kind of get through sometimes the the meager winter of mm -hmm. uh of starvation you know i mean so, it's a little bit like now with the whole covid thing and being also uh restrict you know where are movies where is where are museums where you know what i mean even just gathering with people i mean everyone has to really start getting creative and just trying to find when ways to keep yourself sane and and inspired just I mean, for me, it. I think, thank God, you know, that nature hasn't been off limits, you know, for me, I, I think that being outside and seeing nature is, is one of the most healing and inspiring things, definitely. So that helps serve as a balance for your work. Rob, what do you do to keep yourself inspired and, and nourished in, <laughs> in well, those times? What? <laughs> all right lady ukulele <laughs> that's all it is very simple are you going to take requests <laughs> Love it. and, and, and in the balance of that i think is important as creatives having a, a something that takes you purposefully makes you step away from the canvas a little bit too much i talk quite a bit about being too close to the canvas finding a way to find some balance, stepping away and then reapproaching. Um, for does the, as you move from project to project, um, based on the story, based on the circumstances and the teams, I mean, that's got to change from project to project. When you start, when you're, you're beginning something, um, any uh, uh, rituals, processes, uh, manners, methods that you like to approach? Rituals. I mean, are you, do you sit down as a sacred pig and that sort of thing? I, I don't really go in for those so much. Are uh, you, are you breaking down the story into, you know, is it story first? Is it then you're going out and casting? I mean, talk about how you would get underway with something. The begin well, I mean, you know, if if, if you're self-generating a project, obviously, there comes a point unless you're gonna unless you're gonna write it yourself, which you know I've done and I know Roger does. Um, there is a point where you say I've got a I need I want a partner, right? I want to find somebody who I'm gonna work on this with. Um, and you know, in the case of one thing I'm currently working on. You know, there've been a, a number of different writers kind of involved in the project um, to get a script because ultimately this is all very much based on having a script. Um, you know, getting getting the script in the right in the right place, right? Being ready, having the project starts out as a good idea. There's some development. Maybe there's a draft. It's, things are you know not working or you need need more development, more refinement, but it's really, you know, you're getting, you're getting, the project doesn't really take on a life until it, until there's a screenplay, uh, especially for films. Uh, but I think that's true of pretty much everything. So um, that's the most critical piece. And then once you develop the project to a certain point, obviously then it, then it can continue on its, its life. Uh, but, it, but again, it depends if this is purely independent um, you know, then at some point you're going to find yourself pitching it, right? If you, you get the project started and you say, okay, I'm ready. Now I got to go in and start to pitch it and find hopefully partners who are interested in this material to then, you know, have it move to the next square. So it's, it's, can be a very long, long road. And are you keeping multiple projects going? Um, yeah, you know, it's sort of, you, you have to, I mean, it's a very important, uh, you know, you wouldn't really, I mean, I, yeah. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm in production on something now and, you know, despite that I've, you know, I've got at least two other things that are sort of on a track kind of moving forward. Um, so so it's, keeping those, 
various pots boiling at different times and temperatures. I mean, talk a little bit about the juggling act that that involves. I, I had always been told you're only as good as your next project and what's what's what you can bring down the line as well. So how do you keep your focus on the project at hand, but then what's next? What's Can you take a break? Do you take a break? Um, with what? Yeah. Well, I think that, yes. You know, <laughs> it, it sort of, again, it just sort of depends on how things play out, right? Because neither of us are in a position to green light a project. You know, if we were, that would change the dynamic entirely because you'd say, well, I'm just going to say yes, that we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not in that position, you've got, ultimately got to find partners who are and get to that square. And there, are, there have been projects that I've worked years on that have not managed to get off the ground while others have. So you sort of, and you don't know, it's like, well, I'm going to focus on this because I believe in it and I want it to work. And sometimes those, those projects that haven't gone off the ground well, finally do shockingly you're like you know years later you're like that's the one that seems to be going and you know it's because you never sort of give up hope about it um but but it's but that's a big a big piece of it is to not not you know to kind of work in a circumstance where you don't have ultimate control you know you sort of like you're you're it, you know so you put yourself out there and you're in the middle of the stream and you're you know hoping for the best but you kind of have to take an, you know, an attitude that things happen in their own time or things happen when they're meant to happen, whatever that means, you sort of, it's not meant to be, you know, or, or it's, you know, the, or the thing, you know, the time has come for something and how, what are the, all the, you know, how do this planets align? We often use that description for things, you know, the planets seem to have aligned for this <laughs> and, you know, it's sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's a big piece of how do you, how do you work and sort of, survive inside this complete mystery called Hollywood. <laughs> it's that, that perpetual optimism that you've got to maintain to keep you going, I guess. Matt, I want to, I'm seeing a few more questions go by. Let's, let's jump into those. Yeah, um, this next question is asking how much other experience does a person need from animation, like modeling or character animation, storyboarding, et cetera, before deciding that directing is going to be their thing? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because when I was a CalArts student, um, they focused the program, and I'm not sure that this was entirely intentional, but they really focused the program on filmmaking. And so the, the culmination of everyone's work was to learn everything that you had to learn to be to to be a, you know to work in an animation studio. Uh, you had to learn character design and layout and animation and you know editing and writing and you know m music editing. You had to, basically you were a one man band. You had to do everything, um, and ultimately you made a film at the end of the year, which meant that you were you were really being a director. So I don't think they de designed it this way, but they actually promoted, I, they were really director focused. And a lot of people have come out of CalArts and become directors because in your earliest experience, your job was to make a movie, make a film, you know, tell a story and it's yours. You have to, you have to, you have to come up with the idea, you have to write it, you have to storyboard it yourself, you have to design the characters, you have to animate yourself, you have to cut it yourself, you have to do all the music yourself, do everything yourself. And then you end up with this thing and, and then you're judged based on the quality of the storytelling. You're not judged necessarily based on the quality of the animation. Like the thing that really came forward was, oh, this, this is a great film. It was a great film. You know, you don't, wouldn't necessarily say it's a great piece of animation, although that did happen. But I think, you know, for filmmakers, you got to make a film. So if you're starting, it doesn't matter if you're a student, if you're anywhere, it's easier today than it's ever been before in the history of everything to actually make a movie yourself. It's less expensive. You can do all, everything yourself. It's all available with software that's off the shelf. It's, you know, all these things. So the truth is, is that making a film is the only way you're gonna become a director. You gotta make a film and people have to see the film and go, wow, that's a good film. Matt, keep going. I, Cause I see we've got a number of questions here for them. 
Uh, yeah, the uh, next question here is, is a pitch Bible a good way to pitch an idea? I'm gonna let you take that one, Roger. Well, yeah, okay. Define a pitch Bible for me. I think they mean like what's traditionally just like a, you know, designs and story and, and premises. And I mean, if so, you're, oh, you mean to, to pitch a project, to use a Bible to pitch it? I guess, you, mean, you know. Okay, so like a book of all the, you know, yeah. all the designs and everything. I think it's, well, it sort of depends on the patience of people, you know, and what their, their focus is because different groups will have different focuses um, or foci. Um, it helps. I think it helps everybody. It always helps to have a visual. You know, so it's not just a verbal idea. I think it helps to have a visual. I think it helps to have uh, uh, a synopsis or at least the, 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 a rough telling of the story. So you can, in, in a very short way, tell the whole story. Um, yeah, I mean, if that's what you mean, I think it does help. But I, as I say, it's like, it, depending upon who you're, you're going to be pitching to, some people don't have the patience or the necessarily the vision to sort of take in all of that stuff. But I think almost everybody will respond to an image. I think an image is very important or a few images. And if that answers your question, I'm not sure. I think generally, yeah. I mean, it, it, certainly if you've got a distinct style or approach that you're, you're giving this um, right. to help set the tone and unify the, get everybody on the same page as it were. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing about a pitch, just going back to that, the, the, especially for people that don't do it all the time or feel uncomfortable about it or want to learn how to do it better. The truth is, is that pitching is something you can do every day as long as there's someone else in the room. And what should you be pitching? And the truth is, pitching is actually storytelling, right? Telling a story. What happened to you last night? You know, what happened to you when you were a kid, whatever. And the truth is I, I distinctly remember early, early on, and we're talking when I was a teenager probably, telling somebody a story and the difference between when the story worked, when it landed with people, or when I got to the end of the story and it sort of dissolved or melted into kind of a puddle of nothingness. And then the person who was listening to the story looks at you like, why did I just give you that much time of my life? because you just told me something that has just done nothing for me. It has not enriched me and you know, whatever. And I remember having gone through that and realizing, oh my God, I've got to do a better job at this. Like I have to, you know, if I'm going to tell a story I better make sure it has a good ending, right? Cause if I, cause I, I don't want to leave people with that sense of, well, why, what was that? And you know, and I'm sure we've all been around people that tell stories and don't tell them well. And you're like, oh God, I can't hear another story from this person because they they don't have a point or there's no, you know, what's what's the reason and what's where's the payoff? Where's the punchline? Where's the thing? So the truth is, is that everybody can become better storytellers just by doing it more and learning from the process. Yeah. It's like getting all the bad drawings out of out yeah. of the way to get to the good ones. So much of it is editing. You know, and it's true, like what you're saying, Rob, practicing it, you know, you can refine, you can refine and refine and you find out what, what seems to land and you can, you can feel it when you're telling somebody. 100% you, or not, you know. And, and you tell often the same story to different people, like you would pitch something. And I find that, you know, your first time pitching anything, you're not going to do a great job at. The first time you pitch it, it's going to, you're going to miss moments, you're going to, Love this, you're going to do that. And quite often we would rehearse or practice with each other because you want to refine your pitch too. You don't want to just go out of the gate cold. So if you're pitching something, the most important thing is you want to have enough rehearsal so that you can make a better pitch. You can go, you know, this didn't, this part didn't really work. Or I couldn't express this idea better. Let me think about how I'm going to say that because I need a, I need a better way to do it. And then you can refine it. And after a while, you find that the pitch becomes stronger and stronger. And that's really when, if it's a professional thing, that's really when you want to be pitching it, when it's as strong as it can be. Great points. Uh, let's keep going, because I'm seeing uh, some good specific questions. Yeah, here. this next one's asking, uh, what do you think of becoming a freelance director? Is that even possible? I mean, 
you know, I don't, I'm not sh- uh, freelance director. Uh, yes, I, I think so. Um, but again, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to show, demonstrate your ability as a director in some fashion. So you yep. still have to have some kind of portfolio, right? You have to build a portfolio in order to, 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 to do that as a career. So you've got to start with whatever your first film is, you know, whether it's a student film or something you make, you know, later or whatever. And that the, the work begets more work. And after you build a body of work, then you could say, well, I'm now a, not, it's not just a freelance, but it's a journeyman, you know? So somebody who, who's seen as a competent professional in that area, but it's a process. You can't start there on day one. Good point. Um, let's keep rolling, Matt, because I want to get as many of these in with our remaining time. Yeah, uh, this next was asking, when a project is taking too long in production, how do you keep up your team's morale? We talked about yeah, I think, I think we covered that. It's, but it's an interesting, it's taking too long. It never takes too long. It only takes the amount of time you have <laughs> yeah. for the deadline. And that's what you got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that it could take too. Sometimes you don't want it taking that long. Occasionally a, a, occasionally a date gets pushed, you know, sometimes it's a great reprieve. You're like, oh, you get six more months, which is awesome, but it, very, it happens, you know, not often. Very, yeah, and nothing to count on. It's just something that might land, but nothing to be yeah. counting on as you enter into a project. Um, let's keep rolling, Matt. I'm seeing a few more here. Yeah, so this next one's asking if you've been working in big teams during COVID, uh, what has been your biggest challenges and how do you overcome it? Uh, how were you able to keep everybody on the same page? Well, I have not been working in big teams during COVID, so I can't. So I'm in, I'm in production now actually on a, on a movie that, an animated film that's being done in Montreal. And what's interesting is I was in Montreal in February, last February, right before the world shut down. And the plan was I would fly there every few months to check in with everybody. And obviously that didn't happen. But we were already doing Zoom calls because they're in Montreal and I'm in Los Angeles. And um, it was interesting because at the beginning you would have a Zoom call with a giant room of people. And you couldn't really identify the different people. So you would hear their disembodied voices come back. And you know that was one way to work and it was the best we could do. But then when the lockdown happened, everybody got sent home. And the fortunate thing is everyone can do their work at home because everyone has a computer and they can tie into their work computer. And the difference was that suddenly it was a Zoom call where everybody had their own screen. And it was a miraculous change because suddenly you felt like you were talking to individual people and and it became even more functional because what you're doing is you're working. So I've got this here, I can show you. I've got this great Cintiq right cool. here. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so you can uh, have a meeting where you're looking at animation or layout or whatever on the Cintiq. And while everyone is there, you can draw right on this. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows this, but I mean, it's for me, it's, I've never really had to do it this way before. And it works really well. You know, you, you're, t- you're talking to people, you're drawing over what they're, what they're seeing. And what's great is that it turns out animators have a common language. You know, if you're working as a professional, you understand what an anticipation is, or you understand what the an extreme is or whatever. And there's a lot of jargon, a lot of lingo that you use. And it's amazing because people get it. So you have a meeting, you're talking specifically about something and people are like, yeah, I get it. And so there, there's a great uh, connectivity about it. And it's the process is actually working surprisingly well. One of the many pluses about this industry during this time is that adaptability to the pipeline and keeping things going, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, Although I know a lot of people are anxious to get back into communal creative side are there do you feel there's anything missing anything uh is communication still there effectively we were talking earlier about being in the room for a pitch and being able to read the room do you find any shortfalls um working via zoom 
you, not not from my perspective. I mean, I you'd, I'd have to throw that question back to the to the crew, and I it's a good question. I'd be curious to hear what they had to say. But I I think that when you're working on a on a project, the most important thing is communication. The most critical critical thing that people need to understand you know, what's going on and what you're talking about. And as a director, your, your job is to express your idea, thought, opinion, whatever it is, in a way that the crew understands it and can go take action. And the crew feels very, I think, grateful or good if they understand what's being asked of them, right? If they, under, if they get it, if the communication is good for them, I remember actually working with Eric Larson, who was one of the great nine old men, uh, who was a trainer at Disney when I started, a mentor. And he actually said his advice to the young animators was don't leave the director's office until you're sure you understand what they're asking you. Because when you leave, your job is to go execute. And if you missed the idea, if you didn't really get it, obviously that's a huge problem. So if the process is functional, and people understand what's being asked of them, then they can do their work productively and be, feel good about it. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Um, it, Roger, any mentors or, or uh, advice along those lines that you've received that have guided you in terms of your directing? Any mentors? God, I wish I had mentors. Um, it was well, only really from observing people uh, that I worked under, you know. How about, how about the tour mentors? <laughs> yeah. Tour mentors, yes, that's what it was. <laughs> no, no, it, it's interesting. You know, you learn you learn positive things and negative things from working under people. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, definitely. Which there's importance in the in learning the negatives and what not to do. It's true. It's true. I mean, we're working under a great sets of directors. You know, like uh, Ron and John. Uh, I always really appreciated how thorough they were and they weren't rash. You know, sometimes you'd have to sit there while they were stroking their beard, thinking about things. But I really appreciated that when they made a comment, it wasn't just off the cuff. They had given it some thought. And uh, I, I think I really appreciated that. That was sort of a lesson to, you know, again, what Rob was talking about being clear, you know, that's what helps any production helps anybody. Um, Although I must, I must say, I find a little something missing working over, you know, Zoom and everything, which I did a lot on The Prophet. I was working with people all over the world and it, it was, uh, I still feel there's a certain element a little bit missing through just the video thing. It is really lovely and thank God we have it during this time. Uh, but yeah, I, I get a little extra something when I'm in a room with somebody. I have to say that isn't quite there on Zoom, but it's as close as you can get. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, you know, I think a certain amount of uh, directing that I also learned is like, you know, being a cheerleader and keeping people's spirits up, you know, working on projects that weren't going well and you'd come out of a, a meeting and it was, you know, you're, you felt like you were bashed to the ground, you know, it was important not to communicate that to everybody else because if you, you know, all right, as an individual or, or a couple or a few individuals in that meeting, you had to process that. It really would do no good to dump it out on everybody else because then the whole ship is like going down, you know? So that was one thing also I learned, it's, you know, also just through experience was sometimes you have to eat some of that stuff, you know, and put it behind you and keep everybody else's spirits up so that things can move forward, you know? So it's always, it's always good to try to find things positive to say to people and you know you have to be transparent and you have to tell them what notes were and everything like that but but not you know toss gloom on them and i think that's the worst thing you can do honestly you've got to keep people's spirits up that is huge that is huge and you know everybody it's very easy when you're sitting and working alone and you have somebody to talk to you to, to grouse about things and you know that kind of thing can just grind down the energy on a project. Um, you know, what else? I'm trying to think of who other people I worked under who impressed me in those ways, taught me. Work on the profit, uh, working with such a wide range of artists. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and you know, talk a little bit about juggling that and at a distance. Yeah, I mean, that was interesting too because a lot of these artists were animators who did not work as a team. They were definitely individuals, you know, like Nina Paley puts out her own films. She does the whole thing herself. Bill Plimpton, sometimes he has a little bit of help, but mainly his ideas. So a lot of these people were really strong individuals and also not used to doing something that was also gonna support a larger idea because I was doing this whole over story and it, it had its dramatic line and all these poems that they were animating and illustrating had to support also the storyline as well as be their own personal expression of that thing. So that was interesting. And it was, it was interesting working with different personalities. You know, some, you know, some took a little more talking about things. And well, uh, did it require, you know, working with these artisanal artists, did it, what more did you have to bring to the process to get their work in line with what your vision was? Well, I mean, again, it was trying to balance the individual's creativity and their vision with also that it's also had to serve a larger story. So um, I always tried to, at least if I had to deliver news of, you know, your idea here really isn't supporting the story and sort of tell them why and, you know, just to be as clear as possible and be as understanding as possible. I, I think there were really only only two artists that I basically had to ask them to know, let's start over, you know, because they just weren't, some of them weren't even supporting the, the poem that they were doing, you know. No, you know, and again, that's, you know, people, <laughs> artists are so individual. And those, it's, it's a crazy balancing act when, when you want to, the whole idea is you want to have these people there. The reason you have these people is because of their unique vision. And you don't want to step on that. And at the same time, trying to serve this other thing. I guess the thing is just trying to be sympathetic and really clear. Yeah. And really clear. again, to your point, Rob, about that clarity is so, so vital. And um, I think that's another skill. Uh, if you want to jump in on this about as a uh, director to be able to have an understanding of what you're asking of each person in their role and being very clear about helping them get there. Sure guiding <laughs> a little bit of well, one of the one of the things that I remember Eric Larson used to say all the time was that we're, you're trying to make a positive statement and I don't think he meant that necessarily in the way you would you might think he, he did you know we often talk about positive statements as like sort of being you know whatever but what he actually meant was you're trying to do something that is clear and that reads, that's something that is not hidden or not, not confused or not complicated, but it makes a positive statement. So when you would do animation and you would show it to him, you know, he would talk about the character needs to make a positive statement in this movement. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, that, I think that that's, the, you know, again, you're trying to put form to an idea, right? You're trying to, you're trying to distill something that has meaning, but then you're trying to actually make it make it into an image, you yeah. know, and the image needs to kind of carry that. And as I'm sure we've all seen in, in students' works or our own works when we were young, when we were just starting out, and, you know, it was difficult to draw something with clarity, you know, it was difficult to make it very simple or bold or, you know, it would be overcomplicated or noodly or, you know, there are all these things that it kind of tends to be at the beginning because you're, you haven't learned enough to say, what is essential and what is not essential? What, what, how do you make this really a simple statement? Simplicity is actually very key to all of this because you know, when it, it's, simplicity is extremely deceptive in that it's sometimes the most difficult thing to achieve. Uh, and I know one of the, well, Fred Astaire used to talk about that, that he would work so incredibly hard to make it look easy. Yeah. And that's kind of, I think what we're all doing getting to the truth of all that that is there. Yes. Um, I see we've got just a couple more minutes and Matt, I wanna ensure that we get to some of these key questions. So uh, if you would take us out with a couple more questions that we can fit in. Yeah, um, this next question is asking for, if you have an, any advice for a path to become a more efficient writer. 
Mm. Efficient. Efficient. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because writing doesn't seem to be an efficient uh, uh, vocation at all. I mean, you, <laughs> you have to throw so much stuff out. <laughs> That's part of the efficiency. The classic, uh, the classic thing about screenplay writing is that it's not writing, it's rewriting. And yeah. that's really the truth <laughs> that, is that, you know, you're, you, you write for, the first thing that you do, like any art, you know, you have to kind of, they, we talk about, we say throw, you know, got to throw up on the page, right? You got to throw up something, right? You got to get it out, put it there and then step back and look at what you've done and then make some decisions about it and then start to refine it and, and give it shape and form and all that because the creative process is usually very messy. Right, it's very. It's, it can sometimes be, you know, ugly or, or complicated or unfocused and unclear. But you kind of have to go through that process first, you know, to to sort of get something that's authentic and original and sort of maybe meaningful before you actually figure out what the what's the appropriate form, right? How do you then carve it and polish it and make it look pretty? You know, it start. It st has to start out. It's, you know, with something that's a little bit more like a like a baby being born. So a little messy. <laughs> birth is messy. Yeah, birth is very messy. Very messy. <laughs> Sorry. Roger, so the story is your milieu. Any thoughts on that? On thoughts on being an efficient writer. I, again, I, I echo, you know, Rob, a lot of it is, you know, get it down quickly. I, I would say, you know, don't don't fuss about it or worry about it, just get it down. You can always throw out things, things. Yeah. and it's just, it's, it's sort of like um, getting your voice warmed up a little bit. You know, most singers don't go out on the stage and immediately perform, they, ah, 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 ah. they do lots of exercises to get the vocal cords warmed up and get it going. It's the same thing with writing. Get writing and get writing. And the more you write, the more you write, the more you'll be able to, the more it'll just start to flow more. And then, and then you know, you step back and you reread re and you know, you can see, you know, what's hopefully you can see what's shining and what is, is just dragging everything down. I find the real writing is in the rewrites. <laughs> yeah. um, the extensive drafts or the crisp drafts that you have of something. I remember being work, working at Disney early on, we're talking, you know, mid eighties. And I was writing some material, some treatments or whatever first bird original pitch and I had like this compact computer and it was the early days of personal computers too so I was writing I'd, I'd be writing paragraphs very carefully I'd get several paragraphs and then I would sorry and then I would invariably I would kick the power cord out of the wall and the whole computer <laughs> would be, uh, and I would, have, I would have forgotten to save it because this these were the days before they would automatically save and it would be like, oh my God, hours of labor just sort of disappeared. But then after picking myself up off the floor and going, okay, well, I guess I got to put that back down there. And what did I remember? And how did I, and then it would actually, the second time I'd write it, it was always better. It was like, because, you know, I, I was distilling it, you know, in my mind and then putting it down and go, wow, it's, it's actually, it's, it's much improved. I think that's been the case more often than not, and perhaps the universe telling you, rewrite again. <laughs> exactly. Well, we are quickly coming up to our end here. Um, I want to thank both these extraordinary gentlemen for spending time with us today and for sharing your remarkable insights and experiences into the unique world of, of storytelling through this medium. And uh, we are grateful, I, just based on the comments and these wonderful questions coming in, it's been tremendously helpful for, for so many. And so we are very, very grateful and appreciate it. Thanks Thank all you. to Tina and the CTN teams. Matt, as always, you are right there with what is needed when it's needed. So we are grateful. And thanks everyone for joining in. I hope you're enjoying a terrific round of great events here at CTN. Stay tuned. You've got more great things coming up and all throughout the week. Please be sure to check back regularly. Lots of great information happening for you in the chat line. And join us every Tuesday for Primary Sources, 11 o'clock Pacific Standard Time here on CTN Live. Thanks everybody. Thanks to you, Roger, and to Rob. All thank better you. ahead. We're grateful. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thanks.
Hello everyone, my name is Taliesin. And I'm Evertel. And welcome to the Directing at Blizzard panel uh, with our panel of directors yeah, from our, Blizzard. Our esteemed guests. Um, should we do introductions very quickly and go around? 